dimension. This will be my touch for health. That, that really conditions that we either myself or Dean okay. is sitting at her desk. Because when you press for health, it will have some flesh placed on some persistent, you make the proper selection. Right? I didn't know. When I get up there, I'll open up well, the application. Everyone else is going to do the VC was. Those are the two ways. But phone is generally free. Thank you. I'm curious to get started. I'm using 11 also, so that would be good. So, what are you using Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I just want to take about, about a minute. My name is Dave Powers. I'm the current chair of the um, intellectual property section, the Washington State Bar's intellectual property section. And um, I wanted to just let you know what it took to put this program together. Um, it's actually a coalition of the Washington State Bar's intellectual property section, the um, IEEE's um, IP professional um, initiative, um, Keith Grislak is the, the representative for that. Um, the Law, Technology, and Arts Group from the University of Washington's Law School. And then WISPLA helped us also with getting the word out. And then also you should know that um, Rajiv, um, Rajiv um, Sarathy and um, Jim, stand up Jim, Jim uh, Bonick, uh, worked tirelessly to get this together on very short um, notice. And um, Rajiv spent most of his time in India, so it's amazing that he got it done. And then also, our sponsor is Perkins Coie, and uh, we really appreciate Perkins Coie for stepping in and helping us out um, with this. And so without further ado, I'll let Rajiv get the program started. So thank you to everyone. And also, now's a good time to turn your cell phones on uh, buzz instead of play. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, so this, even though we did a lot of the work to set this all up, uh, a large part of this couldn't have happened without the help of Keith. Keith. Uh, uh, is going to tell you about some programs that uh, he's handled before on a similar topic with some of the same speakers. Um, and, uh, and we thank Keith and all the speakers for coming out here uh, to give us this, uh, this talk today. Um, as far as the uh, schedule itself, uh, we're going to be uh, starting off with Keith, and I'll introduce Keith shortly. And then we're going to move on to, uh, to um, uh, Chico and uh, Bill uh, to talk about derivation law and um, uh, and, and you'll see the full list of topics. I'm not going to go through all of them. They're all in, your, in the materials in front of you. Uh, and then in the afternoon, the lunch session, uh, we're going to have lunch. We're going to stop for lunch to, for you to go to the lunch room to pick up your lunches and come back here. And, uh, and you'll be uh, eating here during the presentation by uh, Honorable uh, Michael uh, Tierney from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, he's going to give us a, uh, a, uh, a view into both uh, what's going to be happening at the uh, uh, the appellate level, as well as what's happening at the regulatory uh, stage right now for implementation of the Act. Uh, and then finally, we'll continue in the afternoon in this room. Um, I'm going to introduce Keith now. Keith uh, Grislak is a uh, is a private practitioner from Spokane. Uh, as David mentioned, he's also um, pretty heavily involved with the IEEE. In fact, he's on their uh, board of directors now, I believe, as well. Starting January. Starting January. Uh, Keith has been uh, involved in aspects of the Act for a very long time, so we're very fortunate to hear him. I don't know if you've spoken to Keith before or heard him speak. Uh, he's, a, he's a terrific speaker. He, he knows his stuff inside and out. Uh, he's been a, uh, uh, a passionate speaker about this topic for a while and has been involved uh, with the IEEE in this space for quite some time now. Uh, Keith uh, practices primarily in the uh, EE space, uh, computer science and um, uh, internet technologies, and, uh, and we're fortunate to hear Keith today. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, I wanted to personally thank uh, the speakers we have today. Um, um, and we're really blessed to have Chico Goals um, uh, come. He, uh, Chico was involved, and Rob Stern were involved in a presentation that IEEE uh, did at George Mason University about a month and a half ago. And I'm going to put in a little pitch before I start. 
Uh, for those of you that aren't here just to get CLE credit, but actually now realize that this is the law, um, we captured our George Mason event, and it is available on video with slides on IEEE USA's website. All you need to do is write down IEEEUSA.org. Go to the front page. I think right now, today, it's the second item, and it's the AIA, and uh, Chico came and presented, Rob Stern presented, Jenna Gangola presented, she helped get us Michael Turney today. Um, so I want to thank uh, those folks, and Michael Fleabert's presentation is also available online, and his partner, Ming Tao Yang, is speaking today. So um, to the extent that you don't just need CLE credit, the patent bar needs to wake up. This is a very significant act. This is not the biggest thing in 40 or 50 years. This is the biggest thing in 140 years. And there is a lot of ambiguity in this act. And I hope to give you a short overview. Um, fortunately, I'm speaking first, so I want to cover everything very quickly without stepping on the other speakers' topics. But I have a series of hypotheticals that I would like to address. Um, I. Uh, I moved to Spokane in 1995, and uh, I don't like podiums, so I'm, I'm going to move around and stay out of the, out of the, out of the uh, camera. I moved to Spokane from uh, where I was practicing law in Ann Arbor, Michigan uh, in 1995. And uh, prior to that, in 1993, I made the mistake of calling the IEEE offices in Washington, D.C. and asking them a question about something that I had seen on IP policy. And I ended up on an intellectual property policy committee that IEEE USA has had now for about 28 years. And I will make a pitch for those of you that are engineers and scientists. There aren't many engineering organizations that deal with policy. Um, policy is very important. And IEEE USA has a policy group in Washington, D.C. that deals with things like H-1B visas, intellectual property. Um, there is a government fellows program. Uh, starting in January 1st, I'm, I was elected as the Vice President of Government Relations, which is a board position. So now I'm going to have to start dealing with uh, those positions. We, we loan engineers to congressional committees to deal with policy and technology issues on the Hill. Um, I was a chair of the IPC Policy Committee for four years, ending last year. And in the process of most of this patent reform legislation, was on the Hill meeting with congressional staff councils and congressmen to discuss the concerns that some of the IEEE members had. Um, so some, I'm curious here, I, I spoke in Seattle at the IP, the state, the state bar IP section in March. How many here for that presentation? There are a few people. Um, I got a lot of good feedback at that presentation. This is probably the sixth or seventh one that I've done this year. I'm going to tell you something up front. I've made a series of presentations to engineers um, in the last four months. The engineers get more lit up about this than the patent attorneys. We need the patent attorneys to get lit up. Because as you're going to hear today, there are some significant things. March 16th, 2013 is very big. And if you wait till March 15th to figure this out and sit down with your clients, you're in trouble. The clients need now to implement business method changes, procedural changes. They need to be looking at their file, you know, their, their patent trees. They need to be looking at continuation claims. They need to decide. Do they want patents in the before system or the after system? Because we're going to have 20 years of patents that are litigated under two different standards. So it's very significant that you get your hands around it now. It takes about an hour to explain the new 103 language. Did anyone here actually try to study 103, the new 103 in this legislation, and try to discern what it means? I'd like to see some hands. I'm curious. I asked this question um, in October in Spokane, where I gave a half hour presentation on essentially the same slides. I just flew through them. And um, I had done that presentation several times, and I was a bit dismayed. You need to sit down and start looking at the 103 language. Um, there are significant issues that, as a practitioner who has to pay malpractice insurance, you need to ask yourself, how am I going to behave? How am I going to advise my clients? If I'm not right on this, I'm really wrong, and it's really bad. So we're going to try to touch on some of those uh, things today. Um, here's what I want to emphasize in this slide set. I pulled a few slides last night. I didn't pull as many I was going to because I'd like to fly through a few things quickly. Um, first inventor to file. Very significant. I think everyone here has heard 
this is a first, you know, we're changing our first to invent system to a first to file system. We've all heard the phrase, race to the patent office. For those of us that may be practicing internationally with clients that file around the world, we probably know a little bit more about it. But I will assert that a lot of businesses don't know all the ramifications of these changes. And it really isn't the first file system. It's a little bit different. There are some nuances here that no one has the answer to. And I'm going to give you one right now. In the legislation, there is a provision for prioritized examination. So as I explained to George Mason University, I think I pointed to Rob Stern and I pointed to Chico. I said, Rob is the first to invent. Chico is the second. I am the third. And we file in that order. First to file under the new system, second to file, third to file. Independent invention, same idea. But I am the third to file, and I pay for prioritized examination. The patent office, at, at the George Mason event, I asked this question of Janet Congola. What happens? The patent office has said they want to issue a patent in a year and a half. And Janet corrected me and said, no, they'd like to issue a patent in about a year. Then I asked, well, I can assert this patent against Rob, who is truly the first to file, and Chico. How do they correct that? No one has given me an answer to that question. I, I think Chico raised the point, well, we had bad patents before. This is a conundrum that people are asking the question right now. Um, so for those of you that are in a, in a breakneck area of technology with a keen competitor, you might want to look at this provision for prioritized examination because I'm not sure how you unwind it. There are going to be bad, poorly or badly issued or incorrectly issued patents under prioritized examination. The way it currently works is examiners pick up a case, it's OCR. So when you file cases currently, they're not searching. And I don't believe that the cases that have gone through the system so far, you know, that they aren't being searched. So eventually there are going to be bad patents issues. So you need to consider that. This is just, just one example of one of the conundrums that's coming out. I want to go through a brief history of the act. Um, did anybody here attend PTO Day? Last, this, this past week, over there. Um, we were talking last night, and uh, I guess something slipped out that was in the DNA about eight days ago. Um, Scott Keith at uh, George Washington University had a debate, and it was reported in the DNA um, early last week. And uh, the DNA reported the total dollar amount estimated that was spent on lobbying for AIA in 2011. Does anyone want to make a guess how much it is? You know. $400 million just in 2011. I would estimate personally about half of that was spent for each of five years prior to that. We may be looking at an act that a billion to $1.4 billion was spent in the past. And I can tell you from my experience on the Hill, somebody's a winner. And I would say that everybody's a winner. So to that extent, you have some foundation as to you know, what happened and in, in, in the amount of dollars that were spent. Now, there was a lot of compromise in getting this act passed. I have friends that are in-house counsel that have told me, oh, finally, we have an act that we like. And I, I gave an example in my last presentation. Um, of one of my best friends who's in-house counsel told me this, and I had to bite my tongue because a month earlier, I'd received a phone call from their lobbyist. And the lobbyists had found I had a meeting with, uh, on behalf of IEEE with uh, Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner. Jim was Jim's grandfather's inventor. He invented Kotex. Ken Kimberly Clark, those of us in Washington State know that, the name of that company. But he has a dear passion over patent reform, and he played a role. Well, this company's lobbyists called me, and they said, this call never happened. We really are against this bill, but publicly we are for this bill. We traded votes. And we can't let anybody know if anybody finds out I'm going to deny it. So a lot of that happened. There are a lot of companies, the corporate council may or may not know why they were for this bill. There were other decisions because of other legislation. At the end of the day, it is now law, and now we have to deal with it. The big question in the IP community is, is there going to be corrective legislation? It's a big debate going on right now. Uh, the rumors are that um, Joe Mattal and Gary Griswold are working on corrective legislation for one aspect. I don't know if it's true, it's just a rumor. But um, it's a big debate amongst many of the presenters because there are issues and concerns and problems with the bill. 
So this bill basically was introduced uh, January 2011. Um, S23 was passed. Um, the House passed their own version. Um, HR 1249, which I presented on here with managers' amendments in March. This is essentially the bill that passed through the Senate um, on September 8, 20, 2011. It was signed into law on September 16th. That is the critical date. 18 months after that date, March 16, 2013, is the implementation of first inventor to file. And the big thing about first inventor to file is um, are you subject to art in the US or around the world? And so for people that want to know what art their claims are subjected to, this is very significant for your portfolios. And you need to start advising your clients on that. You need to start looking at that. Because, um, you know, public use, things on sale all over the world are now prior art. As of that effective date. And there's a standard uh, as to whether the claim was before. And if there is a tainted claim that wasn't basically supported, that was filed in a case, that whole tree then falls under the new system. So you need to understand you have good claim sets that are supported in the original case, filed before that effective date. And you might think of strategies as to how to break groups of claims in a continuation or in a family tree so that these are solid claims, these claims aren't as solid, these claims might infect the tree because you may have a goal with a piece of prior art that could be out there under the new system that isn't available under the old system. And you should be assessing those things now. So these are a few areas in my talks that I have, uh, I have hit on. I'm going to really fly through these things. and I think I'm going to skip these right now and go into some of the sections. I just wanted to give you a summary of the sections in the bill. There are some very, this is the biggest one that I'm going to speak on, Section 3, First Inventor to File. Um, there are a few other things in here. Um, to show the politics of the bill, there are a few things that I have mentioned. Um, so there's a transitional program for business methods. Um, I think many of you heard of that, heard about that. Um, it's essentially a, a re-examination that uh, the Patent Office has to put a priority on. I think it phases out after about four, four and a half years. Eight years. Or eight years, I'm sorry, probably right. Um, re-examination. Yeah, re-exam on steroids is the way Rob is going to, is, is going to present this. Um, there's one other um, designation of satellite offices. You've all heard the discussion of the placement of new offices around the U.S. and, and the jockeying for those positions right now. Um, this is an interesting one that I raised with engineers. I raised this in a presentation three weeks ago at Palo Alto with uh, Startup Alliance Group and a couple of venture capitalists. And one of the inventors said to me, boy, if there was an area, you can read this section, but I don't think there's a person in the room here that can tell me why it's there, because it's not evident in the legislation. So, you know, an inventor said to me, if there was something that, you know, sexual orientation, gender, race, didn't matter, it's inventing. Well, they're tasked with collecting the data now. Whatever they intend to do with this will be in the next bit of legislation. I can't predict what it will be, but you might surmise. Um, There's a pro bono program. Um, if you're bored and you want to read it, I advise there are a lot of other things that you could do to get caught up in this act. Um, Section 37. I'm curious, does anybody here other than the speakers know why Section 37 got into the bill? Okay. Um, I don't like saying the firm name, but um, suffice it to say that somebody missed the 60-day period. The rumors are that law firms spent $17 million lobbying to help pass this bill because they reached a settlement with their insurance carrier for $100 million of liability contingent on maybe the legislation changing retroactively, which it does. So I think they had a $30 million policy. So they're on the hook for $70 million. Don't know if they spent $17 million. That's the rumor. But that provision was put in. I will defend the law firm without saying their name because I personally believe that the practice of patent law, we are all human beings. And we get all capable of making mistakes. Um, seems awfully unforgiving to me, but now retroactively it's no longer the law. Yeah, this was a 
I think, a biotechnology patent. The actual losses in the value of the patent, you can imagine what happened. It probably fell on a weekend. So they fell outside the 60-day window. Um, it was estimated in a range of $1 to $2 billion because of the loss of term extension because it wasn't filed in time. They missed it by a day. So this is, this is how bills are passed. Um, and these are the incentives for passing. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Um, now, one of the important points that I think we need to start thinking about in representing clients, and I've been thinking about this with startups, is bad patents issue. We all know that. We've all seen the criticism in the press and the news. Um, aside from litigation, we've had a couple procedures to deal with bad patents already. This is the current law. This was the current law. Ex parte re-exam, inter, inter partes re-exam. I would advocate that there are now seven techniques. Um, this is a presentation in and of itself. Now, there's probably going to be a cottage industry of lawyers and law firms advising clients on ways. Uh, let's say you're a large entity and you missed a technological uh, iteration. And there's a new upstart down the street. Just imagine the things that you could do with seven techniques where there are different criteria for submitting potential prior art. Just imagine the costs and burdens for a smaller entity to have to defend with that. I could see this as a viable business strategy to squash an up and coming. And so the questions for those of us representing entities that are mid-sized, small-sized startups is, as VCs come in and invest, or as investors come in, how do you plan in your business strategy if you are under the shadow of an entity that's very large, but maybe not as innovative as they were 20 years ago? How do you deal with a succession of patent applications at issue with all these techniques to challenge those patents? Do you have an opt-in with investors? Uh, I know a lot of startup clients just couldn't play that game. There is some talk about placing fees now that rulemaking is, is being proposed and promulgated. Place fees so there's a disincentive to abuse this. Well, that may dissuade some entities, but for really significant technological breakthroughs, large entities will do what they may to suppress new companies from taking their business model away. So this is going to be an up-and-coming area. I predict that in the next year, you are going to see more presentations on the multitude of ways that you can balance and use these techniques as a lawyer to challenge a competitor. How often will they be used? That's debatable. But I believe in significant areas where significant business is at risk, these techniques will be used and they will be used aggressively. So if you're in a situation where you can see this coming, you need to start thinking about all those techniques. You need to start thinking about what you need to do to put yourself in a position that you could actually defend this. One patent issues, and there's a series of challenges. Another patent issues, there's a series of challenges. It doesn't take long to see that this is tantamount to litigation itself. I'm going to skip the false marking. There's an oath provision that helps for those of us that have had to deal with inventors that have, who've had their jobs moved offshore. Um, you know, and the inventor's now working for somebody else, and you're the patent attorney calling them up trying to get these things. There are some provisions to make this life a little bit easier for the, for the companies and for the patent firms. Not, not bad in my mind. Um, you've all heard that best mode can no longer invalidate a claim. Who here has heard that? Can't tell you exactly what it means because the USPTO still has a duty only to issue patents that satisfy best mode. I don't know if OED is going to do something, but, you know, don't think it's a major thing, but it's something in the back of my mind. I wouldn't go bluffing best mode. Wait and see what happens. Um, the USPTO is given fee setting authority in the aggregate, so it's a, I call it a box rule. And one of the points I've made, um, this bothered IEEE and bothers me just a little bit. I think PTO needs to be given some tools, but I could see, you know, I might like this current regime, might not like the next regime. I could see a situation where examiners get moved out of an art group into another art group. The example I like to use is green technology is really hot. Let's move the examiners over there. 
internal combustion engines aren't so hot. Let's put a disincentive. I mean, I think under this Vox rule, they could quadruple the fees for internal combustion engines and cut fees on, they can do what they want within the Vox rule. Could it be abused in the future? Hopefully not. I haven't seen any indication it will, but that was one of our concerns in the legislative process. Tax strategy inventions. This is one that I'd like to just mention briefly. The Dean Prior Art. I, this is akin to someone being knighted. Get on your knee and drop the sword. Uh, basically, you know, no longer patentable. So, you know, is this a trend that we want to see in future legislation, the picking and choosing? And, and I, don't, I won't get into details of how that got in there and who asked for it. But, um, you know, I, I, I was kind of trained. We have a patent system, and it's to promote, you know, these certain things in the Constitution. This is a pick and choose thing, I think. Okay, here's the biggie. First inventor to file. So we're changing from a first to invent system to a first to file system. And I've indicated one of the conundrums that we have asked, which is prioritized exam. Is it really, in all cases, first to file? And how do we correct that? Well, it will be, but there has to be a way to correct some of these procedures. And it isn't self-evident from the current legislation how that will be done. Um, a pitch for rulemaking. Uh, has anyone here submitted any responses to any of the published proposals for rulemaking? Excellent. Um, Janet Gingola made a plea at our George Mason event. This is a big deal. She has a really tough job. There are 10 total packages that are being issued. Uh, we have an IEEE subcommittee trying to respond to some of this. Just for us to get board approval to respond and to act, the timeline is very, very tight. The extent that any of you can follow that and move on it, I would encourage you to do that. Because as Janet said, if we don't get feedback from everybody, we'll end up with an unworkable system. There will be certain types of clients that the system just doesn't work for. And that's extremely important, even though the timeline is a significant crunch. So one of the points that came up in the legislative process was, you know, we got this system where we can have two inventors. And this is a problem. But the data, if you look at it, really only shows this is the percentage of applications where you've got a tiebreaker. The rest of them, 99.85% of them, there is no tiebreaker. And you have a clear grace period. So there was a lot of deliberation as the legislation was being pushed. This fixes this problem. But the grace period is a, is a one-year grace period where there isn't another inventor. And that's the majority of cases. The vast majority of patent applications, this has now changed. And, and we have now, under this system, what I call an eroded grace period. And there are things that you can do to get a grace period. For those few of you that have really looked at the 102 language, um, under the current law, public use and on sale in this country. That's gone with the new legislation. Some have speculated that under the new act, you know, one, how are you going to look for all this prior art? Two, could there be cottage industries generating this prior art? How do you get, how do you verify that the prior art that somebody's generating out of some company in Asia is really prior art. It's way back machine up to the task of showing everything that's been in use or on sale anywhere in the world. This is going to be a new area and a new challenge for us to face. But come March 16, 2013, it's anywhere in the world. Very significant change. So I'm not going to go into significant detail under 102A and 102B, but I'm going to comment on term disclosure. How many of you heard the term disclosures applies to the new 102? Have any of you, how many of you heard a discussion of it? Very significant conundrum and problem. Um, there's the whole deal. I'm not going to go through it, but in particular, I want you to look at this. A disclosure, uh, very significant. For those of us in private practice, that have to pay malpractice insurance. We get a grace period if we make a disclosure, essentially. Now, acts that are derived 
from somebody. If you can show this, you're okay. But in order to get a grace period, you need to make an act of a disclosure. Nobody knows what that is. In the House and the Senate bills, there was a colloquy. And one of them, the colloquy, which is a written record of the intent of the legislation, was submitted the day after the bill was passed. In my mind, that's meaningless. I think that the colloquies just obfuscate what was intended. And so now, uh, many commentators are asking the question, what do you do? Do you rely on a grace period? Is there a grace period? Well, you can get a grace period by making a disclosure. I like to tell audiences that it doesn't matter. Um, David Boundy, who presented to George Mason, made the point that um, it's a 112 first paragraph. And you better have claims until we hear differently from the courts. For those that remember the 52 Act, it was 14 years later that we got Granby John Deere. Who's, who here is going to wait for that many years to get feedback from the courts? The patent office doesn't have substantive rulemaking authority. It doesn't matter what they tell us. But we have to have good guidance as to do we get a grace period? Are we entitled to a grace period? Have we done something that gives us a grace period? But I'm going to explain to you why this really doesn't matter for someone who's paying malpractice insurance. If Rob Stern comes to me, and Rob says, I'm smarter than everybody else. I know what a disclosure is. No one else can tell me. The patent office can say whatever they want, but I know. And I made one yesterday. I did it. I made the disclosure. I want you to be my patent attorney. And I got, a, I got one of those inventions that's not a Eureka. It's like Edison's light bulb. I've got 2,000 filaments to test. And it's going to take me 365 days. And at the end of that, I want you to file my patent application. So I want you to dock it 365 days from yesterday. I'm going to sit down with Rob, and I'm going to tell him I can't do it. And here's why. Because on day 364, somebody else makes a 103, either a disclosure or they file a patent application. All I'm left with is a narrow picture claim because the date of prior art is changed under this new act. No competent patent counsel is going to give a client a year, a disclosure, a one-year grace period because every single day they're at risk. Now, there is a post a couple days ago on Patent Leo where someone posits that maybe this disclosure actually is like the mets and bounds of land that carves out an area of technology. I'm not going to wait for the courts, and I'm not going to risk that position. Because I believe that, um, ultimately, I believe with David Boundy, until the courts tell us otherwise, it's a one twelve first paragraph. And I don't believe the intent is to carve out a field upon which other people's actions, either filed applications or public acts, could create a problem for you. So this is the biggest issue in the bill that no one can clearly answer. If the patent office tells me it's this, I still can't rely on it. I'm waiting to find out what the insurance carriers are going to do. Because if you're wrong on this, it's a huge deal. Now, if it's a 112 first paragraph, here's another issue. If I represent a mid or small sized company, what happens if I make a disclosure? Well, and it, if it's a 112 first paragraph, as David Boundy says, I'm just going to write the darn patent application and file it in a rush. Because you know what this disclosure does? It forces me to disclose publicly my business model immediately. I don't get the 18-month publication grace period. If I'm going to advise my clients, are you stupid? Why would you make a disclosure unless you're a megalith? who wants to broadcast their business model to everybody to assure your continuing customers that you're producing new product lines, I'm not going to tell people that. I'm going to advise all my clients to file solid, provisional, or utility patent applications. Why would you file disclosure and let all your competitors know 18 months earlier what you're doing? So you need to think about that. Even if you can figure out what a disclosure is, is that the right thing to do for your client? Are you going to let your competitors know 18 months earlier what they're doing? Why would you ever do this? 
So what that leaves you with is rushing to the patent office. And I have a series of slides here. There are only a couple instances. I've shown these, I showed these in March here in Seattle. There are only a couple instances where I know somebody has looked at their business model and asked the question, what if I had had to operate under this system? And at the end of my slide presentation, I'm going to show those. What would I have had to done? What would I have had to file? And it means that for all those inventions that aren't Eurekas, they're nailed right away, where they're iterative, which is most engineering, you're probably going to be filing a lot of patent applications, and they're going to be more in a conceptual stage. And if you look at the European system, that's what happens. Many of those cases get dropped. So you're probably going to have to look at techniques to file more quickly, more often. I personally would not advise anybody making a disclosure unless I was representing a market leader that likes broadcasting their future business model to everybody because they're in such a solid position. For most companies, that's probably not a good option. So I would, I would dissuade any of my clients from making a disclosure. They might as well file a patent application at a minimum. They get 18 months. They still can get non-publication requests if they're not going to foreign file. For a lot of startup internet companies from, that I represent, that is a big deal particularly in areas where it takes six years to get a first office action. <laughs> so, right now, we've got this wonderful system, unconditional one-year grace period. That's gone. There's some grace period. You can ask the relevance. You can think of my hypotheticals. I think it's greatly diminished. Will there be corrective legislation to clarify that? The rumor is they're working on it. We'll have to see what happens. So, and this is the David Boundy position. 112 first paragraph. I agree with David. That's how I'm advising my clients. If I don't agree with David and I'm wrong, I'm in a real trouble. So, here's some of the consequences that have been pointed out. So, if there really isn't a grace period, or if it's greatly diminished, you know, one of the things that IEEE is working on right now is how do you go out and talk to venture capitalists? Uh, I made a presentation three weeks ago to Startup Alliance in Palo Alto. I didn't know one of the, of the 56 people in the audience. One was a venture capitalist. I was the only one in the room that didn't know who he was and that he was. He asked some wonderful questions. He was taking a lot of notes. And his comments were, my due diligence list just got one hell of a lot longer. And everybody in the room was listening. And the feedback was, was quite, quite intriguing. How do you go show your skirt to a dozen potential investors that don't want to sign NDAs? Because they don't want to sign NDAs, particularly for startups. Somehow that is going to have to change. Because you're essentially putting at risk the ability to protect the technology that they're investing in. Somehow there has to be an awakening among venture capitalists that is problem. And I only know one that during the legislative process understood that. It was Gary Lauder. Gary's grandmother is S.A. You've probably heard of the company. But Gary understood this very clearly. He wrote a very good article in Forbes magazine about these issues. It has to be solved or we're going to have a difficult problem in financing startups. I mean, that's what they do. They show their skirt. One of the best comments that came out of my presentation in Palo Alto, at the end of the presentation, somebody said, this is what we do. We collaborate. There's 55 of us in a room, and we help each other. This seems like it just shuts the door. So you know what I tell my clients? Trade secret law is a big deal. Patent attorneys are federally registered. You know, those of us that are here in the room are mostly probably also registered in Washington State. You might have to collaborate with attorneys in other states. Our clients are all over the U.S., they're all over the world. What state law provision, what venue provision are you putting in your NDAs? How careful are you about it? I think those things are going to be more important. It's probably a good time now to look at employment agreements, to look at non-disclosure agreements, to look at internal business practices. One of the biggest conundrums is the employee that leaves. Under the old system with grace, Let's say it's not your best inventor, but let's say it's the guy that sits next to your best inventor. What do you do on the day he leaves? You don't know if he's going to go to an IEEE event 
across the country or a job interview and talk about all the things that he knew you were doing? What are the implications if there's no disclosure made that would preserve a grace period for you? I believe a lot of companies haven't started assessing that. I made a presentation in Kalamazoo, Michigan in May to corporate counsel. And some of these were attorneys at firms that had lobbied for this bill. And I got some very interesting emails afterwards. So to that extent, as patent attorneys representing companies in-house or outside, we need to start thinking about that employee that leaves. Now, I believe there are pharma companies that have been dealing with European and Japanese law that understand these issues more than many of us. But I'm not so sure that all the practices that are done in other countries necessarily have been filtered into the U.S. operations. Now, for example, in Denmark, there are very harsh laws for an employee that basically discloses this technology. Germany's similar. I'm not sure that our laws are up to the task. But nonetheless, it's an issue that we're going to have to deal with with our clients. So start thinking about the employee that leaves. So you know, these other issues of the iterations that you're going to have to file, you know, things aren't done, they're conceptual. You're going to have to file quickly and early. Can you sit there and wait on somebody iterating to a commercially viable product? You want to take the risk day by day that there is new 103 art that could be applied to you. Because conception was an interesting thing. It was like a placeholder. You conceived, if you were diligent to reduce to practice, you got to work, you had wiggle room. That's gone. Completely gone. All that matters is file. It's all that matters. So you have to start thinking differently. And at the end, I'm going to show you a couple slides that will help you visualize the kind of thing you're going to need with clients to think about this. But you better start advising them now you better implement changes in their business practice now, because if you wait till March 16th, it's probably a bit too late. So, you know, a lot of cases, public use is going to be the very first event that, you know, validates a solution to a, a particular design. Um, but there are a lot of these situations that would bar a patent under AIA. So. Um, and, some, and there are some arguments that some of the things that are in this act would not necessarily be the same under a European system. So it's not first to file, it's first inventor to file. It's not harmonized. So, for example, um, there are cases where you can make a public use or on sale, but there's no public disclosure. Under AIA, that would be barred. For the rest of the world, it would not be barred. So these are some philosophical questions. I'm going to skip through these. Um, this is kind of the history of the act. Um, there are some constitutional challenges in the works. I don't believe they'll, they'll amount to anything. I actually believe in them, but I don't believe they'll amount to anything. You go back to Whitney and Carter, 1810, the right of patent to the first and true inventor. There are a number of different arguments. I'm not going to, it's an hour just to go into those legal arguments. I just don't think that they're going to have any effect. Um, we are where we are, and we have to deal with it. Um, <clears throat> why, was, why change? You know, there's judicial efficiency and bright line prior art dating. That's very apparent to everybody, I think. Harmonization, we're not quite there. Um, work sharing, we're already hearing about that from PTO. Um, and there are a lot of consequences in our practices, and those are the things I really want to uh, um, deal with. Now, I have a slide that I've inserted that shows the only data point I know that is really close as to what I expect. I expect prior to March, prior and on March 15th, that we're going to see another event that we saw in 1995, which is a filing surge. Um, and hopefully you folks are involved in that because I think it's going to be necessary for your clients. Skip the derivation. Um, so this is the biggest thing. If you don't trigger, if there's not a uh, disclosure, and you don't trigger the grace period, and you're not behaving differently, you have the potential malpractice risk and loss of rights for your clients is very substantial. 
So your judgment in how you advise your client now, conservatively, is very important. I'm personally going to wait till the courts tell me what it means. Otherwise, it's a 112 first paragraph for me. Okay. This is what happened. Ron Katz Nelson, dear friend of mine, uh, poured through PTO data. And this isn't a published paper of his. Um, this is what happened in June of 1995. And I would anticipate seeing a spike like that. I think it's going to be a little bit bigger up here. Um, just because I believe people are going to start looking at their claims. Um, as you're going to hear from the litigation presentation, I think, um, we're going to be litigating under two systems for quite a while. And, you know, I don't know every public use and on sale around the world, and I'd be awfully nervous about a lot of the patents that I had done, key patents for clients, being subjected to art from around the world. I'm even concerned about the veracity of some of those references that might be showing up in a few years. So I'm probably going to advise my clients to really look long and hard at their portfolios and file before by March 15th and to look very carefully at the claim sets that we file and maybe break them into groups. It's a consideration I would advise you to take a look at. There were uh, several studies in the process of debating this patent reform act that a lot of people um, had never seen the McGill study. And this is my next slide. Uh, McGill, you know, candidate converted. We have a data point here. And McGill University did an interesting study. And this was the conclusion. There was a measurable adverse effect on domestic-oriented industries in skew the ownership structure of patented inventions toward large corporations. I triple E passed this study around on the Hill, but nobody really wanted to see it. But it's the only data point I know that's really good, that shows you what's going to happen. Canada experienced this already. So we're going to have to do a better job for those industries that would be otherwise skewed. Those smaller entities, those startups, those looking for funding rounds. We're going to have to be smarter. We're going to have to use trade secrets more. I've already advised clients in a number of areas. To maybe they need to rely on trade secrets. Hey, prior user rights could be a tool of advantage to a small company who doesn't have as much money to file many patent applications. There may be cases where let the large company do this. I may obtain prior user rights without spending any money on patent application filings. So. This is a, an excellent study. Uh, Ron Katz Nelson uh, uh, is in San Diego, California, and Ron is not a patent attorney. For those of you who have never seen his published works, you can Google his, his name and find his Berkeley Press website where a lot of his public works are readily available. Just Google Ron Katz Nelson, it'll be the first hit you get. Um, he was nominated for an award by the National Small Business Administration this year as Advocate of the Year. And he's written a lot of very compelling pieces. Uh, he's a very tenacious person, former Israeli military, ended up in San Diego, got a PhD in electrical engineering. He's an IEEE member. Um, and for those people that have debated him on one of the blogs, he's, uh, he's absolutely tenacious. Ron went back and looked at a company that he started. Ron was a professor in San Diego, and one of the founders of Qualcomm pulled him aside and basically said, you're too bright to be just a professor. You need to start a company. So Ron started a company. Broadband Innovations. It was sold to Motorola in 2006. Ron went back and looked at all the iterations in his company. When it was financed, what he would have had to do differently if this had been the law. And you can see right here, he filed one patent application, 91, 92, 93. So in that period, that three-year period, he would have had to file seven under first inventor to file. Ron will make the point that all these extra green dots, I probably never would have made it to the Motorola acquisition. Just didn't have the fun. In particular, in the last three or four years, we've all seen this with clients. It's been challenging. Even clients with great ideas are having trouble with, you know, A, B, C rounds. So this is a very compelling point. Another person, also an IEEE member, Steve Perlman. For, for those of you see Seattle folks, Steve is a... Prince, former principal scientist at Apple. Uh, he founded Web TV. He's one of the developers of Apple QuickTime. Um, and he, he landed at Microsoft as a group president when they acquired Web TV. 
he went off and created about a dozen other companies under, the, uh, under his banner company, Reardon Technologies. Uh, MOVA is the technology that's used um, in the movie industry. So if you've seen Beowulf, Benjamin Button, this is the reason, reason Benjamin Button won an Academy Award, all the facial character capture. All these boxes are all the iterations that were dead ends for Steve. And these are the critical paths. This is all he really needed to patent. Under first inventor to file, he'd be filing all of these. There aren't many startups. You can go look at public record what he sold web TV for. It was a lot of money. He's got a nice office here briefly in Seattle until someone at Microsoft tapped him on the shoulder and said, Steve, he was working on all these neat projects, and he said, Steve, you're embarrassing the engineers. You're now a group president. You're not actually supposed to be the engineering. He left. And one of my high school classmates is now the director of Microsoft Research. He would probably kill to have the stuff that Steve has developed since leaving Microsoft. That's just the way it is. Big companies can't retain the best inventors always. And so I believe that this, here's a guy that could probably afford to do most of this. And he's got great patent counsel. He's got a couple firms in California retained. But he makes the point that even I would have a heck of a time doing this. I would have to peer this way back. I might not have filed on this one. I don't know which ones are the winners and losers when I'm standing here. I sure do when I'm down here. So this is going to be a challenge for us. Um, one of the other risks in the app that's, that I've gotten a lot of positive feedback is this. Under our old current system, the one that we're currently ending, client can find a file a provisional application and unless, maybe there's been an offer, let's assume there's no offer to sell something ready for patent. There isn't another bar that's been triggered. But you filed a provisional application. And, you know, maybe you didn't vet all the species. The generic terminology isn't fully, you know, there and supported. But you're going to file a regular utility within a year. So the real risk is my priority date. Under the new act, if you file what I would call a squirrely or poor provisional application, and then you file your utility, who's to say that there wasn't something that happened between the filing of the provisional and the utility that was not a disclosure that gave you no grace period? And it turns out you needed support in the later application to support the claims you ultimately got. You may have a dead application. So my advice is to consider that long and hard because at the end of the day, you can't advise clients to file lousy provisional applications. They need to file quickly, but they need to file well. Because it's no longer an issue of losing 12 months of priority. It's an issue of losing everything. You don't really know until you've examined the case and you've seen the prior art references from around the world. Um, Ron also did a very interesting quick study of some historic patents from public data that was available and determined a couple of them were barred. One was an early Hewlett Packard patent, 1938. It's for a variable frequency oscillation generator. He determined that this would have been barred under the new act. Another one was one of the Wright brothers. Filing date, March 23rd, 1903, barred. Now, he, was, he gave deference here to these two others. From the record that's available, he took the position that they would be allowed. The record's not it's historically hard to figure these things out, but he used this as an example of some specific patents that would not have happened. I'm sure there are many more. Um, okay. Summary. Here's some points that I think are important because they've come up in presentations that I made. You still need to corroborate invention records for, for uh, basically derivation proceedings. Interferences are gone, but you still need to keep the record keeping. Um, I think some people think that, oh, that's ending. The point I just made, high quality provisional applications, I am going to take David Boundy's position. It's a 112 first paragraph. And it may be 14 years before we hear from the courts as to whether that's correct. But if I'm wrong, 
I'm in real trouble. I can't afford to tell anybody it's anything but that. So I'm also looking at ways of implementing more aggressively regular weekly, monthly inventor projects or reviews. The hypothetical that David Boundy used at George Mason was patent attorneys are used to sitting in the back seat of a car. You know, every once in a while they nudge their client. Okay, we should probably file on this. Maybe monthly or quarterly there's a patent review meeting. Okay, let's file. David makes a very good point that now it's like that driver's ed car where there's a brake in the front seat and the patent attorney is sitting in the front seat with his foot on the brake because clients can blow it left and right. And there needs to be a structural change in how counsel, either in-house or outside, interacts with those inventors because it's a race. Every day you wait is a day that prior art could be subjected against you. And these are going to have to happen more often. If it's a startup, maybe you need to be on a board position. Maybe you need to be more in an advisory role. Maybe you need to advise them that they need to budget. There need to be more reviews. There is not the grace that we used to have. I would be planning changes structurally with exit interviews with employees. Don't have the answer, but I see the problem. I'm still not sure with some of my clients, they call me up and say, this person's leaving, how do you do a SWAT team? What if that guy goes off? Are you ever going to be able to show that this is something that you're, is derived? You know, once they talk at a presentation, you can't trace. The burden on you to trace that this was derived from something that came from your disclosure to get an exception, pretty darn hard. I'm going to be handling this with exiting employees differently because the risk is loss of IP rights. Um, due diligence, I can tell you from the VCs that have attended presentations I've made, they took a lot of notes, and everyone else in the room paid a lot of attention to it. And the biggest comment I got out of Palo Alto was, wow, my list just got a lot bigger. I've had some discussions with some recently. Are they going to be more compliant? Are they going to start signing NDAs? Some of them will. Maybe you need to couch it in a way that, look, if you're buying in, you're not buying into any rights because you're blowing them by talking to me. That's going to be more challenging. This is a big problem for in-house counsel. You know, we've seen a lot of corporate counsel pare back the number of outside counsel that they use to do prosecution. Well, the fact of the matter is outside counsel will have A and B and C clients. I mean, they can't all be A's. And not everyone can get the fastest service and the best service. And in-house counsel may need to use more outside counsel because it's going to be more important that things get turned around more promptly. If they rationalize out outside counsel and only use a few, can they really turn around a significant event? And this actually struck me this summer while I was out fishing with my brother and another colleague who's in-house counsel and got a phone call at 5 in the morning. We were up in Alaska. And an inventor wanted to go on national television. The day before, he told me this act is good. And I sat there and thought, well, two years from now, he's going to be flying home on this fishing trip because his vacation will be ruined. Things will change. And in-house counsel may need to have at hand more access to do things more expediently. Because we know how disruptive innovation is, and we know how these things come in, and all of a sudden there's a lot of applications that need to be filed. Time is of the essence under the new law. I would consider in key strategic areas of technology where there's a big advancement and there's a large shadow with a big entity that I would probably look seriously at prioritized exam. I haven't filed any cases yet, but I would think about that in key areas because the consequences are that someone else can cut in line. And then you're going to have to figure out how to unwind that. No one's explained that to me yet, other than litigation down the road seven or eight years later. So, and for some of my clients, this may not be the way I was trained to see the Patent Act and the constitutional justification for it. It's encourage disclosure. I know a number of patent attorneys that are trade secrets are the real deal, and we're going to start using those more and more. 
What's the net effect? I think it will slow down the development of technology to some extent. Any questions? There are some. Um, are there some cases where the on sale bar under the new act could, could occur in secret? That's been posited by a number of attorneys. Um, I'm not going to defend it, but it's been raised, and I, I think it is possible. Okay, because, because of course it says, you know, or otherwise publicly disclosed, which tends to suggest that everything preceding it, including the on sale, must be public in some way. One of, one of the other arguments relating to that that I did not mention is that those are terms in patent law that have precedent. And there is some debate right now as to whether the new act gives new interpretation to what those terms mean. I'm going to take the position that the precedent in patent law for on, uh, public use on sale are the ones that I'm going to follow. But that's a big conundrum. It's a big question. You're asking a question that many people are asking. And, and I can give you an answer, but it's a, it's a guesstimate. I'm going for conservative wherever I can, because the consequence of losing a right will put me in a situation where I have to lobby to get a 60-day mm -hmm. term extension, and I'm not willing to spend $17 million to do that. Well, Keith, going back to the, uh, to the elimination of the best mode requirement, I've heard uh, experts on duty of disclosure and inequitable conduct argue in conferences that you should you should assume that there still is a best mode requirement under the law from a from an inequitable conduct perspective, and that if you encourage a client to hold back the best mode, uh, you are in big trouble. Do you have any comments on how you can have a requirement? in the law that is not a requirement and what are the implications of what they've done with best mode? I don't have an answer to Rob's good question, but I'll tell you how I'm going to behave. There's still a best mode requirement. My, my clients have all heard this. I'm not waiting for a letter or call from OED. I'm certainly not going to provide another prong in litigation. Um, and if a client comes to me and says, we want to obfuscate what we're going to commercially launch, I'm not going to play that game. I'll let somebody else be the test case so one Tuesday at lunch I can listen to one of my partners describe the case law to me. But it's not going to be my name in here. I mean, there is still a best mode requirement in my book. And I would advise everybody else here to consider it that way. Any other questions? Your uh, next word, third from the bottom of the practice tips, you say educate the client about increased filings for working of for more conceptual applications. That seems to fly in the face of your statement about the 112 first paragraph. Well, no, no, no. I'm, what I'm saying is sometimes invention is eureka. Man, I just nailed it and I figured it out. A lot of times it's Edison. 2,000 filaments. You know, if you could do those 2,000 filaments in 11 months, you could just wrap that application up and file it. Assuming you didn't have the risk of you know, uh, uh, independent inventor, and you could show diligence, and I wouldn't rely on diligence for 11 months, but you get the sense that you can, you can kind of glom together groups of time with iterations. Other than a new system, you know, I know some inventors that they're quite prolific and iterative. There's 30 iterations. When are you going to file? How comfortable you are? Are you in waiting? I'm still saying you've got to write something top notch. But you're going to iterate that more and more because the clock is ticking. And you know, you wait for that third iteration. And that ends up being a limitation that gets you your significant protection. Yet there's a 103 reference that was filed the day before, or a presentation in Thailand. Too late. Conception doesn't matter anymore. All that matters is filing. So, for those of us with portfolios, this is going to be a challenge. We have to start thinking differently. We have to start asking questions of the biotech people that have been dealing with this. 
the pharma people that have been dealing with this substantially with their portfolios. But now we have to do it with U.S. clients that principally have relied on their U.S. portfolios for licensing of it. Any other? I can give you none other than a 112 first paragraph. Because there aren't anything from I just told you, the 112 first paragraph, and if I'm wrong, I think that's malpractice. And since no one can tell me, I'm taking the position it's a 112 first paragraph. You have to look at the act. Um, good question. No one's asked me that question. Um, the way the act reads, I think the answer is um, under U.S. law. No, I think you get you get the disclosure carves out. And the debate now is: Do you get specifically what you disclosed, or do you define a territory in mets and bounds? And you can go to Pat and Leo, and I think it was on Wednesday of this week. There was a posting. Read the comments. I don't agree with the commentator that wrote it, but um, that's, that's part of the ambiguity. I would advise strongly everyone here start looking at 102. I've done this with my partners for two years now, and I, I, was, I was the first person in, um, in Leahy Staff Council's office, Aaron Cooper's office, asking him what the word disclosure was. And my friend Ron Katz Nelson was in a week later. To the extent that you like the 102 language, I will say this. If you like the 102 language after you read it, thank Gary Griswold and Bob Armitage. They wrote it. I've shared that with many audiences. Somebody's going to call me eventually. To the extent that you like it, thank them. It's really a mess. Thank you. Uh, you know, I will say that uh, Bob Armitage just got the, uh, from IAM uh, last year, in June, got uh, membership in the inventor in, in the uh, IP Hall of Fame uh, based on uh, first inventor to five. So I, I think that there has been a very successful public rela public relations program done by the proponents for this change. But all that is moot now. It's it's the law. We have to deal with it. Everyone needs to wake up. This is not something that you can. Roll your sleeves up on March 1st, 2013, and deal with it. It'll be too late. You said at the start that uh, somebody put that billion dollars into the you know, lobby assets, and somebody is a winner. You can't name any names. Any uh, you know what? Um, you can't blame corporations, nonprofits. You'd be amazed. I, I, know, I know the names because I've had these discussions for five or six years. You can't blame entities for helping themselves. But you can blame Congress for, for, the patent system isn't here for Acme Company, it's not here for a startup, it's not here for patent attorneys. It's here for the public good. And I'd love to share some quotes that I probably won't share because I'll really offend some people. But you know, if there are certain people, if you think they're sitting in the ivory towers of a certain law school looking out for patent law for the public good, you're darn wrong. And I think we all have come to that realization. The patent bar needs to be looking out for this. And, and, and I'm gonna, I'll give you a quote that I cherish. I don't want to offend anybody here. But David Boundy shares a great quote with me. Patent attorneys make lousy lawyers. And I challenge all of you to counter that. Because we're all engineers and we're not involved in politics and we're not involved in policy, but it determines everything. We need to be more active as a patent bar in playing a role. Because most of us represent a spectrum of clients. You may have 100 clients. One of them was lobbying for this bill. My own firm, my own circumstances is, is identical to everybody else's here. 99 are hurt. Most patent attorneys would not say a word for fear of affecting that one client. But somehow, there needs to be the patent bar playing a significant role. Not many people know that the American Bar Association, for example, had passed 17 resolutions going back to 1965 that supported a first-to-invent patent system. A couple fellows got involved in that committee and carefully unwound all 17 of those resolutions to get the ABA to support this legislation. 
Why? Because most of the patent bar wasn't paying attention. If there were more balance, if there were more participation in these organizations, and more thought-provoking discussion about why do we have a patent system and who is it here to benefit? Is this a balanced ecosystem or is it an imbalance? And you can't blame an entity for helping themselves. That's what they do. But you can blame all of us and you can blame congressmen for not looking out for balance. But now we have to deal with it. And I, my, my advice to everybody is to get moving. It's, it's a tough challenge to grasp this, to advise your clients, and to put things in place by, by the critical date, March 16th. Thank you. on the back. Yeah, I'm glad to see we've got some of this. Okay. See, it's in more in front of them. That's fine. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I didn't remember you. I've been almost three years. Yeah. Hey, Al. I don't know if there's just a bad